Okay, well it's three o'clock. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, oh, I just I've lost the participants. Um, there's now over a thousand people uh, online joining us. Um, sorry to make you anxious, Julie. Um, <laughs> And yeah, so just to say welcome to all of you. I'm David Murphy. I'm the current president of the British Psychological Society. Um, and we're here for the next 45 minutes to talk about um, psychological aspects of well-being in staff who are involved in, in uh, the front line of the COVID crisis. Um, we'll introduce ourselves in a minute and then do, do an int brief introduction to all of you, um, not by going round, but by doing a poll and trying to find out who, a bit about who you are. Um, but I'll start off with um, uh, an apology because there's a thousand people who are online, but there's about 2000 people who signed up who are not online currently live. Those people will be watching it again on demand. So just to apologize for those people that you couldn't join live, but you'll be able to see the same thing and you'll be able to fast forward the bits with me that are probably less interesting than the bits with Julie. Um, <laughs> So I should say that um, when I, oh, I, perhaps I should share my screen now. That would be a good time to do it. Um, if I can share the screen. And from the beginning. Okay, so now we've got um, the slides up. So we've got a hashtag if people want to live tweet or tweet after the event. Um, the, and the hashtag we came up with was C19 staff wellbeing. Um, so that's the two of us, bit bigger pictures of the, the two of us. I look better from a distance. Uh, that's probably <laughs> even further than that. So I'm the 2019-20 uh, president of the British Psychological Society. Um, I'm a clinical psychologist, and it's my great privilege to, be, to, to hold that position, um, particularly at such a time of, of challenge. Um, my background is actually coincidentally as a clinical psychologist and um, in, for most of my 30 year um, career I've been working as a clinical psychologist in acute hospital settings. I started life working in spinal injuries and, and worked across various medical specialties and then was head of psychology services at Imperial uh, College Healthcare in London for many years and also the psychology lead for teaching medical students. Um, and then I moved into clinical psychology training um, in Oxford and currently I'm doing research on clinical leadership alongside being BPS president. Um, I'll just let Julie introduce herself. Hello everyone, so I'm Julie Highfield. I'm currently a consultant clinical psychologist in ICU, both um, adult and paediatric intensive care. Um, I've been doing some work for quite some years now with the Intensive Care Society and Staff Wellbeing and it's a core part of my role, um, but I've always worked in medical settings and now in this COVID um, pandemic, uh, the coronavirus pandemic, what I've now um, been involved in is is this work with the BPS, but also the National Emergency Critical Care Group. So I'm the lead for staff wellbeing uh, for that as well. So uh, many strings to my bow um, to, to kind of prepare me for this work. Um, and the other people that you see in the in the boxes there, uh, Thomas, Catherine and Helen are members of BPS staff. Teresa is another member of the guidance development group who will come uh, on, come into life when we deal with the Q&A. So, um, the, the plan of action is to, Julie and I are going to talk through um, the guidance and a bit of background to the guidance for hopefully about 25 minutes and then that should leave about 20 minutes for questions. And the question and answer feature is open now so you can start answering, asking questions. Given that there's a thousand people, um, I suspect there'll be quite a lot of questions. So the other thing to do is upvote questions that seem relevant or sort of similar to the sort of thing you, you're wanting to know so that we can respond to the questions that are, are most sort of common to, to people. Um, so at that point, I don't know, Thomas, if you can open the poll. So we, rather than going around and introducing each of you, we thought we'd do a poll to try and just get an idea of who's online. So are you able to um, activate that, Thomas? That's activated for you, David. Okay, great. So we'll run that, and hopefully it's not going to be too distracting for people if we carry on and just run that poll while we while we're going on. So I'll just um, put this tiny bit into context. Um, so the BPS uh, it has got a um, coordinating group uh, looking at our response to the COVID crisis. Um, and oh, I meant to say actually that um, for those of you who don't know, the British Psychological Society, it, we're the um, professional body and learned society for psychology in the United Kingdom and uh, sort of made up of 60,000 members ranging from 
undergraduate students to people in academic um, research roles, practitioner psychologists, and people who've done psychology degrees and are applying it in different ways in different uh, roles. So within that, there's a huge resource, I think, to, to bring to, to try and uh, make a positive contribution to the COVID crisis. And this is the sort of um, map. It started off life as, a, as a, a, a handwritten drawing that I posted on Twitter and got a huge response. Actually, there's an article in next month's Psychologist magazine that explains a bit about that and how the groups got together, if you're interested. But I'm not going to go through all of this, but this is how we're looking at our sort of response and our contribution, really, to, to um, trying to help in the COVID crisis and make a positive contribution and really... Um, you can see that there's a number of aspects that are specifically related to COVID itself and the kind of consequences, direct consequences that we're looking at. And this, this work we're talking about today falls in uh, within that, the sort of effect of COVID and, and um, the burden on healthcare staff and how we can consider psychological needs in relation to that. But also there's another side of it, which is the wider professional, uh, uh, well, the professional impact, but also wider society impact. So having to work differently as um, it's particularly psychologists, but also other um, professionals, and, and also the effects on people in general. And within our work, which hasn't been sort of um, illustrated in this diagram yet, but I really want to make this point, we're really very conscious of the um, e e equity sort of aspects of, of COVID and how um, this crisis has really exacerbated existing sort of inequities in society and and so inclusion and diversity is a, is a very strong theme that we're trying to well we are including in all of our work streams um, so i just wanted to make that point um, and so within this staff support group we um, pr have produced this guidance that was launched on tuesday and that came into being um, we drew a, on a guidance development group um, we identified the impact of, of the sort of demand on the health service and healthcare staff of, of COVID would be a significant challenge and um, you know we were thinking about how psychology could inform responding to that challenge and you'll see in the guidance there's a sort of list of practical um, suggestions oh that's the bit I should have mentioned at the top um, of your screens that's the BPS COVID um, uh, resource page. So our report, this report is on that page along with other bits of um, useful information. So it, even if you can catch that, the BPS website has a, a link right on its front page. Um, so within this work stream we pulled together a group that didn't exist this time last week um, and we were able to draw on resources from really all over to, to bring together a group of experts um, both from within the UK and um, in internationally. Um, to, to really try and distill down what, what psychology can contribute to um, this particular aspect of protecting and uh, psychological well-being. And there's a picture of the group in action um, that last Saturday. So the group was been very busy over the, over the weekend um, producing uh, this, this guidance. And I just want to say, I mean, this is a, a panel of, of, of real experts in the field and we were able to draw on some incredibly very generous colleagues um, to, from, from a range of disciplines. Bob Mander is a, a psychiatrist. Um, Katie Scales is a, a, a critical care con nurse consultant who I had worked with some years ago and hadn't seen for a while, but volunteered to help with this. So this is, a, I think, we've, what bringing these perspectives together has produced some really helpful guidance. But I should say there are other experts out there. Um, so this is, we're not saying that this is the, you know, the, the, the be all and end all, but it, we're trying to put this together in order to give something that's helpful to people who are involved in frontline care or psychologists uh, who are contributing to, to that group. I don't know if you want to say anything else there, Julie? Uh, no, just um, the huge effort and energy that was put in in this um, this typical COVID time frame. Um, so thanks to everyone who contributed um, because it, it, it took quite an effort to turn it around so quickly. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll take the opportunity to thank you, Judy, because Judy's been juggling this with lots of other demands on her plate. Um, so, um, um, I just want to, I'm not going to go through the, the background to all the research. In fact, in the guidance, well, actually on the end of the slides, we've put some references that can you can do that because we didn't want to take up too much time doing this. But I, I just want to make the point that we can actually draw on quite a lot of background knowledge to inform how we, we go forward with coping with COVID. Um, I mean, I'm going to focus on the, the sort of um, epidemic uh, outbreak type um, 
literature, but of course we do know a lot about health service staff coping in challenging circumstances, which you know happens quite regularly. So you know I think there is a lot to draw on from other literature about um, stress and burnout in healthcare staff, and and you know this isn't obvious. This is a different kind of challenge that we're facing in sort of intensity and duration but we know we do know there is literature to draw on but I'll just briefly focus now on what we know about um, sort of similar disease outbreaks and um, uh, in 2003 there was a, a outbreak as many of you remember of SARS a, another coronavirus variant which was particularly uh, affected Toronto in Canada and the psychiatrist who was a member of our panel Bob Mander um, was uh, carried out a research study looking at the effect of the, of the SARS outbreak on health service staff and the, the um, location of the, the uh, outbreak was restricted to, to Toronto. So nine hospitals in Toronto treated 500 SARS patients over a period of months. Um, and what they did was compare those healthcare staffs who had had experience of caring for the SARS patients with nearby 50 kilometers away Hamilton Hospital, which didn't receive any SARS patients. And they followed the staff up um, one to two years later. And what they found was um, quite significant differences within the two groups. And I mean, it's probably worth just bearing in mind that those other staff were probably sort of on in the kind of prepared stage to contribute to the, to the SARS outbreak. So they will have experienced some degree of um, consequences of the outbreak themselves but um, what was found was that there were significantly higher levels of um, burnout in the Toronto staff um, which were, who were primarily nurses I think about 70% were nurses 30% um, were over the threshold on the Maslach burnout in inventory um, and um, psychological distress was significantly higher and post-traumatic stress um, and 14% were over the threshold of um, 26 on the impact of event scale um, it's also relevant when we come on to talk about the effects of psychological stress to, to note that um, there was a report of behaviour change, other sort of consequences. Um, so over 20% of the Toronto staff reported increased smoking and alcohol intake. And I think that was compared to about 8% of the Hamilton staff. Um, and um, uh, there were much more, uh, again, 20% of the staff reported missing more than one shift a month because of illness. And again, that was more than double the rate of the Hamilton staff. We know, so just distilling the lessons from the, the SARS uh, epidemic, um, the sorts of things that were, were um, found to be helpful were coordinated responses with telephone lines for, for the public um, and also resources for um, healthcare staff that were needed to be coordinated and also linked with uh, mental health services. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this in terms of the current situation, but this is some of the lessons that came out of the um, SARS epidemic. And, supervision and input from mental health staff but in a sort of coherent whole was the was some of the lessons that came up we've already got some initial lessons from covid um some of our chinese colleagues have, have been really um great at, at getting some information out into the literature of some of the um issues that they've faced and the things that have come out from chinese colleagues are certainly that staff represent the needs as particularly related to um, physical needs, access to PPE, um, although actually in the Chinese studies, the, the fear of contamination didn't seem to be that, that high. Um, it may well be that they had different levels of access. Um, supporting Support staff to, to, to help with um, tasks and rest areas were key things um, and accommodation. Um, they also reported staff that um, struggled to actually manage patient um, uh, difficult presentations from patients' anxiety. And you know, I think we'll come back to this point about how patient relative well-being and staff well-being can't, you know, they have to be considered together. Um, so those are some of the lessons. And this is just some anecdotal accounts that you know I've picked up, and I'm sure people have seen on social media. So this was a, a, in fact a colleague in um, Spain who I had some conversation with over Twitter. And he was particularly talking about the demands, obviously the demands on clinical care, but the, the, the sort of effects of, of communication with, with relatives. And um, he was highlighting the difficulty of keeping relatives in touch and then the, the, the feelings of being unable to, to perform adequate care. Um, and that was even uh, illustrated more strongly in a post that was on social media just this weekend about a nurse who 
um, reported feeling extremely distressed by having to uh, tell the family of, of somebody who was dying that they couldn't go and see him and say goodbye. And just, you know, that obviously having an, a, an effect on the, on the relatives, but also on the staff member themselves. So these are some things that are themes that are already coming out and we'll come back to these, I think, as we go on. Um, so uh, I think I'm handing over to you here, aren't I? So I'm <laughs> handing over to you. Over to me. Um, and I, I guess that the reality is, is we have learning from SARS, we have learning from COVID in, in China, or Italy and Spain. Um, oh. But uh, some of this, we, we're, we're kind of estimating and, and we're, we're trying to work out as we go along. But what we have is a sense that this, you know, the, the idea of this sort of flattened curve, etc., that the, the virus will peak and then it will trough. So the demand on healthcare services will peak and then it will flatten out um, in terms of acute uh, front line. But of course, there is then the kind of knock on effect of all of that. So everything we're cancelling now, we have to pick up further down the line. So it's not really a smooth peak and trough. But what we did know is that the psychological responses are going to vary phase by phase. So for those of you who saw the document I produced on the 12th of um of march which feels like about a year ago for the intensive care society i had five phases in this but we kind of brought it down with the the expert reference group into three phases um and and really the action phase is the active phase is is kind of um two-parter so what what we know is in all of this preparation people have been kind of pushing 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 to kind of get going get prepared and adapting really really quickly what we have in our healthcare system um, and so with that comes just this just high stress anticipatory anxiety but also a little bit of excitement um, isn't it interesting when you push healthcare services some of the the systems that are really quite clunky actually can be pushed on with you with the right kind of resource um, but what we do acknowledge now everyone's in a slightly different place in the UK and people listening abroad might be in slightly different places but we're, we're pretty Pretty much aware that most UK health trusts feel like they've done the preparing and actually they're exhausted with preparing and a lot of people are getting going or, or on that cliff edge kind of can't wait to get going so kind of moving more to the active phase we, we're kind of anticipating that we'll see two halves of this active phase so there's the first part where actually it's the come on we can do it kind of feeling where actually people feel like they can step up and I think a lot of ED and um, uh, ICU colleagues uh, some colleagues from theatres feel like they're built for this actually so there's this sort of sense of rising to the challenge um, but in rising to the challenge and rising quickly we respond on instinct and that affects our thinking in, and and starts to kind of wear away at, at the edges a little bit so um, thinking about loose boundaries um, I as a psychologist would never have responded to a whatsapp at 10 at night from a consultant but that's what I was having to do last night so the, the kind of social norms and things that we would normally do start to slip and also we start to see some interesting behaviors that we've certainly seen in supermarkets we see the same kind of survival behaviors starting to emerge as people are trying to get things done um, so what we know is as we move through this action active phase that this is a long haul you know that line that this is a marathon not a sprint that was in my ICS stuff is, has gone out there quite a bit so really what we're expecting in this kind of um next part of this active phase is that people will start to get worn out with it people will start to kind of question what's going on and I think have we got a next slide I think, I think we're gonna, you're gonna pass over to me at this point Okay, yeah. That, yeah. Um, so before I do that, I just want to, I, uh, this picture I put here, because I think it's oh, really yes. very illustrative of this. So Dina Asher-Smith Asher, Asher is, is just obviously in the action phase sprinting, but, but the focus is so clear in, in her eyes. And I think that's where people are in the action phase that very, and sometimes that tunnel vision that you mentioned, Julie, can, you know, sometimes, you, you, you know, you would be able to solve a problem or, or, or think what to do, but just you don't have that kind of ability to step back. And I think that's, that's something that the sort of, you know sometimes just a stepping back for a tiny bit can can be helpful in that phase and we'll, we'll go on and to I, that. I think what what we've seen within that is just such a huge surge of information that people are overloaded already 
yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, that's another thing with this picture. So I'm going on about this picture, but I think you know you're running that fast. The, everything else is a blur, and I know my email inbox is a complete blur. I can't read emails because I just. I, I, in fact, I just responded to someone in the BPS this morning by saying I can't read your email; it's too long. And it's you know you get into that thing. <laughs> I've done that uh, too. And I think you know staff are very much in that uh, in that mode. And I think yeah. those other people who are sort of relating to people in that mode need to take that into account. So, the trouble with this um, action phase is that sometimes it can be a long long road uh, mm -hmm. and the track runs out and then you start going into the mud and then it starts getting a lot more hard going uh, and um, in this phase of disillusionment and exhaustion really so starts to set in and this I think you know Judy's identified as an area of particular kind of psychological uh, challenges kind of can arise and you know people are on that automatic pilot and going 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 but then suddenly exhaustion can hit quite suddenly um, and the effects of neglecting physical and psychological care can can obviously have kind of a, a knock-on effect and a cognitive effect um, the other thing that we've highlighted in in the guidance and and has been highlighted very helpfully in some other uh, guidance neil greenberg's guidance really focuses on this is moral distress and injury um, as some of the conditions people find themselves in um, and, and then again, acting sort of, you know, in a sort of automatic mode, suddenly people find that that's conflicting with their basic sort of ethical um, values um, and sometimes sort of too late. And, and so it's, you know, we'll, again, we'll come back to this about how to keep those in mind, even though clearly it's, it's a challenging and, you know, different situation in which you're applying them. Um, and so the... Um, Final phase in the in the um, sort of this this idea of act, um, preparation action recovery is the is the recovery phase, and we'll certainly go on to talk about this um, a bit more later. But I think the the things to, that we want to emphasize here is that people uh, well the first thing I think is really important to emphasize that most staff will feel able to cope successfully using their own preferred style, and that might look very different for different staff. There may be some differences if you looked at staff groups as a whole, but you know it's important to recognize that people um, cope cope differently um, and draw on different resources so you know it's, it's definitely important not to have a kind of one-size-fits-all um, model and, and many will be changed in a, in a positive way I think we wanted to just make a note of um, you know at this stage sometimes people start to ruminate and think about what they should have done differently and and um, you know, in, in healthcare, we often have situations of things that are sort of traumatic, and then after the event, we start going over it and thinking about what we could have, could have done differently. And you know, sometimes that's necessary. Sometimes it can become unhelpful. But um, that that can you know sort of related to shame and guilt. And I think you know, I think one of the things we're aware of is that there is a national heroes narrative around healthcare staff now, and and that will be. Um, throughout this crisis, which, you know, that, that's clearly, you know, uh, that's not going to change and it's got lots of positives to it. But for some people that might to create a bit of a sense of dissonance and separation. And I think it's important to be aware of that. And it may be important to sort of have spaces where you can move away from that and be a bit more open. Um, staff can share a bit more openly. Um, you know, some particularly one of the things with moral injury is then a sense of resentment towards uh, the organisation, either a local or national level the sort of snowballing of the impacts we talked about earlier, the changes in behaviour, withdrawal, avoidance. I mean, some of the sort of um, traumatic um, symptoms can, can lead to, to avoidance, to avoid the, the triggering of that. Um, and that might at extreme mean, mean you know, uh, uh, leaving the work environment, um, but also can have triggering effects on family relationships. Stress can, can cause sort of um, difficulties in, in family relationships and also social relationships. And of course, that can just exacerbate things further. So it's like a sort of snowball um, building up. Um, and certainly some staff will, will have chronic difficulties, which um, you know, will we'll then become sort of self-perpetuating, and and that you know, well, we think the most sort of prevalent one will be will be burnout, compassion fatigue, and and moral injury. But also, we certainly know that that a, a, certain, a proportion of staff will also experience post-traumatic mm -hmm. stress. So I think the point. Oh, did you want to come in? Oh no, no, you carry on. So um, I think the point that I think we really want to emphasize through this guidance, uh, well, there's lots of points, but one point that we want to emphasize is that psychological needs of staff is not something to think about just at the end of all of this. So it's not a case of really just going through this and then at the end of it, we kind of, you know, think about the psychologist to come and pick the staff up because, you know, there's a lot that can be done at each of those stages to um, 
protect psychological well-being of staff and you'll see that some of it's quite practical um, and doesn't involve you know lots of psychologists going in but it's really important to be thinking of psychological well-being of staff all the way through I think is a point that we really want to make and not just sort of thinking about well we'll pick up you know any any sort of fallout at the end of it we'll, we'll collect that up and pick and deal with it at the end because it can be prevented I think that's that you know there's there are things we can be doing now actually as in you know as soon as you finish watching this webinar to mitigate and reduce the risks of um, psychological sort of uh, difficulties uh, in staff. I'll pass back to Julie. So we're going to start with the first three recommendations. Okay, so in, in essence, the, the 10 recommendations are recommendations for looking after staff well-being in, in any kind of situations, but now everything else is ramped up, stress is ramped up. These are more important than ever before. Um, leadership, we know, is massively linked to employee experience and employee well-being, but one of the things that we particularly recommend within leadership at the moment is accessible and visible leadership. Um, this is unprecedented we don't expect you to go around with the answers and I think often people in leadership positions want to go around in a can-do problem-solving way but I think sometimes just showing up and showing that you're you're in this with your staff and that you're struggling with this I think also for psychologists to not sit back and wait for staff to come to them but in reach and show that visible leadership as well is really really key I think two, really think about communication. Um, I right now um, am overwhelmed with information coming in from all sources and all different mediums. And I think, you know, so it might feel for some the horse has bolted, but there is still time to pull back and think about that systematic way of communicating with your staff. So I on our ICU really early on started these staff bulletins every couple of days that we share with the staff and basically they look forward to seeing it because they feel really in the loop so really think about how you're getting information out there in a trickle feed kind of way but a hugely important thing maybe that should have been number one in many ways is the access to physical safety needs um, because actually if we think about this as a whole and if we move on to the next slide um, David actually a real really really big part of this is it's pushing our threat systems all of us feel somewhat to some degree unsafe with this and if we can't get the physiological safety the physical safety right then we're going to really struggle with the psychological safety so um, I know people think gosh PPE what's, what's everyone complaining about but it's incredibly important that we are protecting our staff through and through um, but we also need to think about the fact that they can't get time off to go and buy a sandwich are we taking food into them are we hiding hydrating them are we making sure that that they're getting um, their breaks etc etc we need to think about those basic basic needs being met and I know in my own health board they're doing things like putting um, up hotels and things like that for staff as well because a lot of staff don't fear infection they fear infecting others and need to be away from elderly relatives etc so the physical safety is is absolutely paramount to promoting the psychological safety and sometimes that being present as a leader and putting things in place for your staff actually can alleviate a lot of the extra things they have to think about and actually really help them to feel a bit more grounded. I think we just we need to probably speed up a little bit, Julie, yeah. given the, the time. Yeah. Um, but I, I just make the point that it works in the other way as well. That psychological health also has a as a uh, an impact on physical health and also clinical care and physical safety. Um, yeah. Okay, so thinking about the other things that are really important, um, a lot of what's happened within coronavirus is, is disconnection. And it's really, really important that we think about how we can ensure peer support and human connection in any way. So, you know, things like uh, some people might be losing staff rooms right now because they're being taken over with storage and things like that. We, we must be very, very careful to protect space for staff to connect with each other. Um, I think the thing that we've certainly learned from uh, Wuhan is that this 
the patients and the families who are coming in are absolutely terrified and that is something that's just a bit too much for the staff to handle they've already got a really narrow bandwidth so they're struggling to handle this so actually this is where our psychologists can come in and help with strategies to manage uh, patients and family anxieties um, to, in order to, to take another burden away um, in terms of everyone's psychological responses it's it's very important in in terms of normalizing this is unprecedented we do not expect people to hold in their distress and it really is okay to not be okay but it is distressing to witness your colleagues being not okay and it is okay to acknowledge that in yourself i think it's also worth knowing that if you're feeling okay right now and wondering what all the fuss is about then maybe you were built for this and that's okay too but there will be people who will need extra help and I think when we think about our kind of ways of checking in and, and delivering psychological care in stepped ways, if we go to the triangle in the next slide, we can take you through that, the way in which we're suggesting that you deliver um, psychological care. So those basic needs being met. The next level is making sure that the information that we're sharing with people is clear, um, but we're also giving them access to online things, video, short video clips, one page how to's, those kinds of things so that they've got ideas about psychological well-being and then provide some in-house psychological support at a first aid level. So often a kind of rapid access one-off check in bring down from the ceiling and then for some people they'll need much more of a sort of monitoring approach let's check back you had a traumatic day at work let's check back and see how you're doing in a couple of days or a couple of weeks time and there will be a small proportion that will be able to access and actually have the headspace to make use of psychological intervention right now i think a lot of people who will benefit from more of an ongoing approach are the managers the people managing a lot of distressed people and that lovely quote from Wuhan there and um, many staff mentioned they didn't need a psychologist but needed more rest without interruption and enough protective supplies yeah okay and and um the just the final three uh, recommendations in in this phase um to I mean, we, we recognise that the environments people are working in, um, particularly if, if some staff are working in that some of the, the big sort of mega units that are being built are going to look very different to how st care normally looks and the pressures people are going to be under are going to be different. But so, so it's going to be necessary to innovate to implement psychological care um, in, a, in a coordinated way. But it's really important to, to do that. And it needs to obviously be within organisational policies, but trying to... In, put, put the principles of compassionate care and I think you know I've seen some examples and talking to colleagues about you know trying to work with look at using mobile phones for patients to communicate using windows that the relatives can view through just being creative in the environment but just recognizing that you know psychological care is is often you know about just a connection or and and it may not be the frontline staff that have to to um, deliver all the psychological care themselves but knowing that it's been delivered I think can relieve the burden and like that quote from the nurse earlier you know it's it's you know, knowing that there is that connection between relatives and information flowing Julie will talk about um, you know, in using um, uh, information line for relatives just knowing that that's happening uh, can be can be really important um, so just being you know having some sort of innovation I, I there was an example on the news of a, a a healthcare assistant in Spain that had taken on herself to put on Twitter that she was taking messages for relatives and, and delivering them because she was working in the hot zone and just you know it may look different but just that you know just thinking about that connection and how you can keep that up and that compassion is so important even though it will clearly look different under challenging circumstances and again, you know, in decision making, just coming back to the core NHS values and thinking about how we can operationalize them in this situation. It will obviously look different, but, you know, we still have our core NHS values, particularly compassion, respect and dignity. And everyone counts is a, a one, obviously, one of the core NHS values. And just thinking about how, you know, not losing sight of them completely, just trying to keep them in mind and how we can adapt the way we work to, to, to put them into practice. Um, and this, the last one here is, um, as Julie mentioned earlier, take care of yourself and pace yourself. And we know, you know, sadly, we know that this is not going to be over anytime soon. It is going to be a long haul with COVID. And it's really important for us to pace ourselves. And um, 
this this little image here is Eliud Kipchoge, who, is, as you probably know, um, wrote the, was the first person to run the marathon under two hours. And 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 I like this picture because when he did it, he didn't do it on his own. He didn't do it even in a race. He did it surrounded by people who were setting the pace for him. And I think that's a, a really nice example that how we're going to get through this is by you know working together to to make sure that we all pace ourselves. Um, and uh, when we were talking about this earlier, Julie was saying, well, actually, maybe the role of psychologists can be to help set the pace for, for other staff. Um, and, you know, we, we, you know, I think we're, we're, relate, we're needing to rely on each other and setting the pace for, for each other is, is a really important point. I think so, someone needs to help with the rapid speed of everything going. We need people around who can sort of slow down and take the thinking space and work some of these things out because people's ability to problem solve is, is rapidly going. So, so I, I think quickly, but very importantly, is that the um, the peak may um, ebb off for the virus and the incidents, but actually the psychological peak uh, may maintain and the recovery may take a long time and, and long time. We're talking kind of a couple of years, really. Um, I think, you know, uh, people will need to take stock um, and to, to kind of uh, make sense of what they've been through and to kind of reflect back. I think it's when people kind of pause and, and realise what they've been through that some of the impact of this will hit. Um, but some of that actually, and, and there is certainly a role for, for psychologists facilitating that, but I, I think some of that actually will come to positives as well and learning and kind of some of the things that we learn from this will be about actually systems that, that were never fit for purpose in the first place and kind of really getting your staff involved in that um, and I think also the, the the thanks and the rewards and be very careful of the, the kind of hero worshipping uh, one offs um, much more of the thanking everyone for pulling together is incredibly important and ask your staff um, towards the end of this when when we're, we're sort of taking stock what do they need now ask them to tell you what they want access to um, I think quite likely there will be a, a few people who are then in that reflective phase and able to access their in-house employee well-being services if you don't have them then you should be maybe developing them internally now um, not helicoptering people in necessarily but building this into the system for future resilience is a really really good idea and just thinking about networks and peer support and how um, nurses therapists doctors are very good at, at kind of buddying up and supporting each other so making sure that we're, we're kind of um, maintaining and and, and uh, experiencing expanding those systems too. Great, thanks. Um, so there's just some, I mean, we've skirted over quite a lot of, we've sort of touched on literature that's been produced. There is some really good stuff that's come out very recently. Um, so you might want to just take a screenshot of this or uh, if you're obviously watching it back, you can, you can um, uh, just um, sl slow it down. But um, we'll move on now to open up to some questions we took a tiny bit longer than we had planned for for the presentation but hopefully it's been useful but we'll um, move on now and take some questions so we're going to also rely on uh, or draw on the support of Teresa Jones who's another member of our uh, panel who's a clinical psychologist who's um, got a lot of experience working internationally in um, medical emergencies um, and Catherine Scott the um, director of policy for the um, BPSC is going to um, help with sort of organising the questions of which we've got um, how many questions we've got uh, 47 open 47. questions so um, yeah do you want to, to, to fire away Catherine? Certainly. Yeah. Thanks David I've been trying to pull out some themes from from your questions and I think the first one just to sort of give you a, um, a, a straightforward question is what would you prioritise um, in, a, in a service where there's competing resources what would be your top priority to Julie? <laughs> Top priority, what out of the list of 10 or out of anything at all? I think, what would you prioritise if you've got limited resources? Um, goodness me. I, 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 I would that's, say... That's a really difficult question because if suggesting that you would prioritise one thing over another is, is kind of the biggest kind of moral distress thing right now. Um, so if I'm thinking in terms of priorities for just people's psychological well-being, physical safety. Absolutely, that would be my number one. 
And I would say, I think it's been important, I mean, both within the BPS coping with this um, and within the NHS, uh, and within the country, actually, <clears throat> we can sometimes think, oh, our resources are very limited, but sometimes it, it, it just means a sort of opening out our scope a little bit and thinking about how we can draw on resources that we hadn't thought of before. I mean, on the on the news last night, there was the, the thing about testing capacity by using universities. And, you know, in the BPS, we're using, you know, what well, the example of how Teresa is on here is that Teresa responded to a tweet that I sent with the original diagram. And we got into a conversation and Teresa was just an amazing resource that I wouldn't have thought of if I just thought, oh, what's our BPS resources? And so I think you do need to open in a crisis. You need to have a, you know, just be a bit more open to thinking about where the resources are that we can draw on. So probably a second resource to protect as much as possible is um, thinking space for so thinking outside the box. We're terrible at, at just thinking right. in terms of the box and, and, and our rigid processes in uh, in the NHS. So actually preserving some headspace and time for, for people in, in key positions who can kind of do things like get in touch with different people, read the research, kind of connect all of these ideas and innovate and change systems um, rapidly. Right. Absolutely. Okay, we better try and get a few more, yeah. through a few more Let's questions. More. <laughs> the next question is sort of linked. It's around how do we balance the kind of priorities of needing to wear that um, physical um, PPE versus sticking to some of our psychological best practice in terms of creating relationships and building relationships. Uh, there's a few questions around kind of how to balance that tension. I think Theresa might have something to say on this. <laughs> Yeah, no, sure. Thank you. And and thank you very much for having me on the panel as well. Um, oh, thank you very much for being there. I can't see you, Teresa. Are you, or is that? Oh, okay. I don't want to force you to put your video on. But... <laughs> no, I can. I can. Ah, great. So the question is around balancing the need protection. to wear quite heavy protective equipment, but also to create connection and to humanise the relationship between people involved in healthcare. And we see this in lots of different um, health emergency settings. So having worked in the Ebola context, that's certainly a big issue. The protective equipment is quite extensive there. Um, and I think part of that was really working on good communication skills. It was working on things like having, having your name on your equipment, even having a picture of you on your equipment um, to use touch as much as you can, because in that case, if you're, if you're wearing full PPE, that's still very possible. Um, and also some of these, these new innovations using mobile phones, using screens to be able to connect patients with families has been really important as well. Um, but it is difficult and it is tough and it requires during training around infection prevention and control is also integrating these elements into that training. So it's not just about wearing the equipment, it's about using it as well. Um, and I think we also underestimate how scary it is for patients to to be in that setting surrounded surrounded by this equipment so to really keep it in mind what the experience is like for them as well has been really really important in other contexts and will be the same now brilliant thanks so much Teresa. Um, so the next question is around specifically working on mental health wards. There's a number of um, questions have come from people who are working on inpatient mental health wards with um, patients who experience psychosis and paranoia um, and how this has increased quite dramatically um, since COVID. Is there any sort of suggestions you can make specifically for those on the, the webinar who, who are working in those services? Over to you, David. I'm in ICU. <laughs> <laughs> well, my my background's in um, a, a, a working in acute uh, settings, so um, I don't know if Teresa's got anything to say on that. Um, I, I can maybe add a bit, just um, in case, of, um, for us to think about what basic needs might be in this situation. So, if you're already confused and distressed, mm -hmm. and then suddenly this environment around you becomes very different. I think there's a need to really think about orientation, helping people know where they are, what's going on to the extent that that, that needs to happen, but just to kind of think what are the basic needs here for the patient. Um, I think that would be really important yeah. in, in more of an acute mental health setting. I think maybe if you then extend that into kind of, if you're thinking about kind of dementia wards as well, um, someone was asking me this week about labor ward, everyone's anxiety is ramped up right now. So thinking about those basic needs kind of across. I think, I mean, I think in a, a, that sort of a broader point about that, that we that we very much got in mind is that the, 
impact of the COVID crisis, you know, is not the same for everyone. It, it, there's a relationship between the COVID crisis and, and, and people's own sort of individual backgrounds and people with particular backgrounds are going to, you know, have particular challenges. So in the, in the BPS work, we're doing work on different streams, uh, children with special educational needs, um, people with autistic spectrum conditions, and just trying to think about how their needs and, and the COVID crisis kind of can, can be managed together. So it's, I think, it, you know, it's, it's very important not to kind of just sort of extrapolate our own experience of, of the COVID crisis or even you know out of hospital just being at home and just kind of extrapolate it to everyone else we do need to think about what the experience of different groups is probably time for um i've lost the track of the time now is are we uh, are we strict in terms of timing till um quarter two uh, or can we go on a little bit longer somebody i think we can go on a little bit longer i do have a few more questions i could put to you okay well i think we, I mean, I think we're all happy to, to go on uh, a bit longer yeah. so, and we won't be offended if any uh, participants... Uh, yeah, we've, we've still got out. a thousand people on the line, so okay. let's, let's, so we'll know, let's we'll get know, through some questions. If, if it gets down to ten, then we'll know that... We, we There's a few that. questions around what can we do around supporting um, the well-being of um, staff in the sort of wider NHS, so thinking about people like GPs, uh, community pharmacists and other support staff what can be done particularly around their mental health and well-being? Um, well, I'll jump in and, and the others can, can um, pick up uh, that point. I mean, I think that's actually, what I, I, it's good to, to pull it back. And certainly when we're writing these guidance, we, so I'm, I'm just going to even broaden it out even more because when we're writing this guidance, we're particularly aware that it's very easy. And if you look at the coverage on the news, it's, it's, it's very easy for people to just focus on doctors and nurses and think about an acute setting to think about those as the people who are at sort of risk of psychological um, sort of consequences of this crisis. But we, we know from experience and from um, research that actually the, 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 the effect is much wider um, within within hospital settings there are other staff groups that are that are equally affected and often you know don't don't get so much attention so that be be portering staff um catering staff um you know uh, radiographers physiotherapists um you know it's, and, and admin staff i mean some of the, the the research that's coming out is is showing that the the admin staff and the people who are having to actually be outside the hot zone and relate to to, to relatives and take calls from relatives are actually under more um, pressure in in some ways because of the the, the, the that aspect of it having falling on them, uh, and so obviously that again even wider than that are people in in um, pharmacies and GPs who. So I think it, you know the principles of what we're saying definitely apply to all groups, and I think it's important to to recognise that and to think about obviously how it might be operationalised might be might be different for in different settings. I don't know if you want to come in, Julie. So I, I think one of the interesting things from Bob Maunder's work is that the ED staff, the ICU staff were less traumatized than the peripheral staff. Mm. And I think the thing is, is that ED, ICU, you simulate this stuff all the time, maybe not mm. at this level, but you mm. choose this area because you like this high pace, high risk work. And I think it's, it's the areas that are not used to experiencing high pace, high risk, death, um, distress, distressed relatives, they're the ones that we need to worry ab about in in terms of um kind of how do we how do we skill them up rapidly in that and i think that's that's where um that help in terms of supporting the patients and the families and um, so helping them to manage that um making sure things like the physical needs and the breaks and and the sort of down regulating is really really happening there and i think the information and the communication is really key for these people who are not not um maybe not able to process this information at such a high level and maybe they need things kind of spelled out to them in different kinds of ways um to enable them to really understand what's going on and and make sense of their own personal risks and and look after themselves in this I think that's right. And I think there are individual sort of factors, but also then there's sort of peer support can be can be more of a challenge in different settings, can't it, if people are oh, working more in isolation. So I think yeah. even we talk about being flexible, but having a system, systematic approach to peer support. And I think that may, may be even more important for people who are, you know, don't have such an immediate sort of yeah. peer support network around them. OK, should we try another question, Catherine? Yeah, sure. So there's a, a specific question about debriefing. So do you feel that there is a need for structured debriefing as opposed to unstructured debriefing to provide a safe space for colleagues to collect their thoughts and learning themes after shift? Or do you feel that this may do more harm than good? So I'll take that and say 
if you read the guidance, there's an embedded link uh, that tells you exactly what you should and shouldn't do around debriefing. Debriefing is um, is a bit of a controversial term. There's a kind of mixed term, um, messages about um, how it's kind of how effective it is and the impacts of it. And I think the the most important things that I say um, it's very hard to get rid of the word debrief because my clinical colleagues love to use it, and but I can't, I, I actually it. tend to say detox don't de debrief so in a way let's think about um storytelling sharing experiences in a voluntary way is really important with the right kind of person listening but actually enforcing structured um you must turn up and we'll go through this in a certain kind of way that's that's the stuff where where the riskiness lies but rather than go into the the whole detail of that look at the document Follow the, follow the link about traumatic events and the do's and don'ts. Right. I will just add as well, from a global mental health level, um, debriefing has, again, been a controversial topic after emergencies, not just health emergencies, but other emergencies as well. Um, and I think you, you probably noticed in the document the reference to psychological first aid, and that has been used as an alternative mm -hmm. approach. Yeah. Um, and that's really looking at uh, promoting safety, stabilizing and connecting individuals to help and resources and again this might be very practical help in the moment listening to what people need and connecting them to those needs you don't need to push people to tell the story and this approach it's it's gaining an evidence base there hasn't because of the limitations and emergencies been any rcts but if you do some reading around this and there's a very good who link that we can maybe drop in the window or we can we can circulate to all participants that We'll share a bit more about it. I think it also comes back to the point that we meant, made, uh, made earlier about individual differences in coping and over my kind of 30 years I've often been called on to sort of come in and sort of respond to a, t a situation where staff have had to cope with something very traumatic and you know with, 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 with in that situation my, my first thing is to, if speaking to some individual always to say you know what normally co helps you in times of sort of crisis and you know people have got things that they've found helpful before and I think going in and, and, and sort of imposing things on people is mm. you know it's not surprising we found that not not helpful and I think you know it, it it's already starting to build on people's strengths of what's been helpful before and it does look very different with different people but can can be equally effective so we, you know we know that with with um, patients in healthcare settings that people cope in different ways I mean there's a very long literature on how you're matching sort of the way sort of uh, technique to help people cope with a difficult uh, stressful procedures um depends on their coping style and, and you know it would you know at the end of the day staff are people as well we're not a different kind of species so that, that you know i think it's an important thing to think about individual differences and people's own coping strengths um in any of this work i, I think as a rule of thumb for anyone who's not trained in any way just asking hey that was tough are you okay is actually a really really important thing show acknowledging um and and giving Giving people the opportunity to talk but not making them feel that they have to talk is very very key yeah great okay we might make this the last one as we're, we're coming up to the hour um, okay. and you, you may want to wrap up but there's just variations on a theme of how can I help um, and I think you know we've got everybody on here from undergraduate students um, we've got people who are working um, in other parts of the healthcare system um, we've got people who are volunteering with um, community groups and just a, a general question about what's the most valuable thing that they can contribute I, I mean, I'll start that and I think Julie might come in. I, I would say, um, I think, again, to some extent it does, it, you know, I think there is an instinctive kind of rush to, to, to sort of action with this. And, and you know, in, within the group, we kind of rushed in and, and came up with the first version. Then we took a step back and thought and, and said, well, who, you know, what are we trying to do here? What's the, what's the aim? Who, who are we trying to help? Who, who are the, the people that actually... You know we can make most impact with and, and that was a really important process in the guidelines because we we started off on one angle and came back and so i think it's the same thing in in, in for individuals to think about well what, what what do i bring to this sort of crisis and it might be i mean you know people can have a lot of psychological skills but it might be other kinds of things that you can bring as well to to the situation and take a step back and think well who's who's around what can i actually you know who can i help with and you know i think a lot of us at the moment are you know um 
you know, connecting with people that we maybe haven't connected with before and saying, is there anything I can do to help? And I think that's helpful. And also just looking around us, you know, I mean, you know, there, there might well be people living next door who, who, you know, could, could do with the, with the help and actually we can make a big difference by going to Tesco's for them. Um, so, I, I, you know, and it may well be that there's, there's things we can do within our job settings differently and reaching out to people. But I think it's about listening to what people are saying they, they need and not imposing, jumping straight in uh, and also thinking what we can bring. So I do need, it's probably got something more. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd agree with all of your points. I, I think what, what I've seen is a, a surge to rescue psychologically um, and and thinking that the answer to that is a psychological intervention. And I think let's be very careful because that kind of says that we, we don't want to see you upset with this. And actually we know that this is going to be a really stressful period of time. And I, I think what, what we can, you can do to help now are the kinds of things that, that David are describing. Um, I think, you know, a lot of psychological services are, are reshuffling themselves in terms of their capacity with things that have been cancelled and trying to reshuffle to, to create some capacity to help and that you know there may be local people who can add and buffer that capacity but actually given that this has only been about sort of a, a, a three weeks a, a month or so actually organizing lots and lots of volunteers is actually a hindrance right now so we need to be very careful about lots and lots of people coming in now when this is a marathon not a sprint so let people organize themselves get themselves in line and then actually you'll find that there's probably stuff over time that emerges that you can be helpful with but the first thing you can do right now is probably buy a box of eggs for your neighbor <laughs> actually and those kinds of things so think think small don't don't think global too much with this and, and I'll just come in and I think this might be a nice point to wrap it up actually because I think you know it's helpful to to take a step back and think well what's what's behind me trying to sort of rescue and often it's our own distress and I think it is worth us all recognizing that you know the distress is not just out there whoever we are whatever our backgrounds whether we're medics nurses psychologists the distress isn't just out there this covid crisis doesn't just affect everybody else it affects us as well and, and I think recognizing that for me personally I've got an elderly mother who I worry about I've got my wife with medical conditions and you know people I know and so you know it's, it's about recognizing that it does affect us as well and we need to think about the impact on that and manage our own self-care and manage our own psychological well-being because again we're, we're, we're people as well and so I think that, that that's an important thing to bear in mind and take care of ourselves and it is a marathon not not a sprint even if it feels like a sprinterthon at times we need to um, you know pace ourselves and look after ourselves so that's probably a good as any point to finish on so I hope this has been helpful to people um, do keep the conversation going we've got the Twitter hashtag um, I think we've been sharing uh, I don't know if we've been able to share some things but we'll certainly um, share as much as we can and, and you know this it's obviously a long going process so this isn't just all of the sort of input that BPS is going to give we're going to there's going to be other resources and webinars and things so I hope it's been helpful and thanks for your time uh, Julie and Teresa and all the BPS staff in helping and, and everyone who's joined us um, online. I hope it's been useful for you and uh, take care, stay well.